Welcome to Mojo Travels, and today we're discussing what flying was like in the 1960s. For this list, we're flying back in time to see just how much public air travel has changed over the past 60 years. Are you a fan of our videos? Be sure to subscribe to Mojo Travels and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. The Glamour Nowadays, flying is nobody's favourite part of the trip. In the 1960s, though, flying was promoted as a glamorous addition to the travel experience. It was less like a tedious stepping stone and more like going to an airborne longue. Planes were designed to create a relaxing environment through visually pleasing colour palettes, complimentary service, and spacious legroom. Following the Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8, the roominess was cranked up a notch with the introduction of the Boeing 747, or Jumbo Jet, which first flew in 1969. While the airline ads made you want to explore exotic sites, the flight aimed to set a majestic tone. Looking beyond the glamour, however, the golden age of flying, as some describe it, had issues beneath the surface. The High Cost While modern plane tickets aren't cheap, you can save a fair deal of money by flying coach, booking far in advance, and racking up frequent flyer points. Flying was far less economic in the old days, however. After years of only having one class, TWA would introduce a two-class system in 1955. Even then, their idea of a bargain mainly catered to the wealthy. A TWA flight from Boston to Los Angeles cost $106 in 1955. In 1965, that would be closer to $124. In 2021, it would be almost $1,080 after inflation. And that's not even taking the round trip into consideration. If you think that's excessive, an international flight from New York to Paris would have cost over $3,000 one way in 2021. Flying was glamorous for a reason. Eating and drinking. As costly as flying was, you can't say that passengers didn't get their money's worth. Contemporary flyers consider themselves lucky if they receive a free bag of peanuts and a cup of water to wash it down. That's a far cry from the multi-course meals they served in the 60s, complete with fancy silverware and tablecloths. Since iPads and laptops didn't exist back then, people would stay occupied with bottomless glasses of wine, champagne, and other alcoholic beverages on the house. Even economy passengers ate and drank like royalty. Despite technically being complimentary, the food and drinks were largely why airfare was so high. As excessive as 60s air travel was, the 70s took things to new heights with the introduction of piano bars. Passing the time Drinking wasn't the only way to pass the time on long flights. Smoking was also a common time killer. As shocking as it sounds, non-smoking sections weren't introduced until the 70s before more airplanes started banning smoking altogether. Of course, not every form of in-flight entertainment was potentially hazardous to one's health and safety. Naturally, people would read books, magazines, and newspapers. This was, of course, before Kindle Kids. The mid-60s also brought the innovation of in-flight movies with pneumatic headsets. The first picture ever screened was 1961's By Love Possessed on a TWA first-class flight. The viewing experience and headphones have come a long way. It was still a major stepping stone, although passengers would have to wait until the mid-80s for personal audio players. Accidents Many would argue that commercial air travel today is safer than driving. Plane accidents were far more common in the so-called golden age, however. According to Forbes, US air carriers saw 7.9 accidents per every 100 million miles in 1960 alone. That year's most infamous incident involved two planes colliding mid-air in New York. The Federal Aviation Act of 1958 had only been passed two years earlier following a similar accident. Some reports claim that turbulence was so bad that your neck could suffer injury. The planes went up to modern safety standards, from the glass dividers to the sharper edges. Inferior designs aside, pilots weren't as well trained as they are now either. More relaxed security Layback safety measures also contributed to plane incidents in the 1960s. Now, we're used to arriving over an hour before our flight, knowing that security is going to be a nightmare. What if we told you that people used to arrive shortly before their flight took off without any identification? Friends and family could even accompany you to the plane at no extra charge. While that sounds appealing given the obstacle course we have to endure today, airline security has upped their game for a reason. While aircraft hijackings weren't unheard of during the previous decades, they became increasingly rampant in the 60s. According to the Associated Press in 1969, the US saw one plane hijacking every six days during the height of the crisis. Flight Attendants By the mid-30s, women primarily filled flight attendant positions, remaining a norm well into the 60s. 
Unfortunately, flight attendants were also constant targets of sexism and unwanted advances, and stewardesses, as they were then known, were overtly often hired based on appearance. Their duties consisted of cleaning and serving, with safety being an afterthought. Until the 1970s, attendants could even get fired if they got married or had children. Nevertheless, the 1967 novel Coffee, Tea or Me inaccurately painted being a flight attendant as a glamorous gig. Although the book was originally said to be a memoir by attendants Trudy Baker and Rachel Jones, a man named Donald Bain was later revealed as the true writer, which kinda says everything. Getting Dressed Up Today, airplane passengers typically only get dressed up if they're coming from or going to a business meeting. Otherwise, why wear your fanciest clothes if you're just going to be sweaty and uncomfortable? Since flying was marketed as a luxurious experience into the 60s though, patrons were encouraged to dress as if they were going to an upscale restaurant. In a way, passengers were going to a restaurant. It just so happened to be one that served classy food and drinks up in the air. If you could afford the airfare, chances are you had at least one designer suit or dress in your closet. According to Pan Am Vice President Thor Johnson, there were dress codes, but people would have dressed well even without rules. Pan Am Speaking of Pan Am, few names in the industry epitomize high class throughout the 60s quite like this airline. Peaking during the decade, Pan American World Airways became revered for its efficient personnel and numerous innovations. In 1958, it emerged as the first US airline to embrace the jet age, flying New Yorkers to Paris in eight hours. Pan Am would thus solidify its position as the top airway for international and overseas flights. The idea that Pan Am wouldn't be a prominent player for decades to come seemed unthinkable. Between the airline's high cost and struggling economy though, Pan Am was about $1 million in debt by the mid-70s. From there, it was a gradual decline until Pan Am ceased operations in 1991. Inequality in the air Sadly, flying wasn't shared equally by all communities going into the 60s, as people of colour were both overtly and structurally excluded. While people of colour could travel via air, segregation and discrimination remained widespread. Although this demonstrates why the golden age of flying was truly anything but, a few barriers would be broken during this decade. Ruth Carol Taylor set the stage for change in 1958 as America's first African-American flight attendant. In 1964, David E. Harris became the first African-American pilot for a commercial airline, following Marlon Green's landmark court case. That same year, Jerry Mock became the first woman to fly around the world solo. Airlines still had a long way to go, but the 60s did mark a necessary turning point. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Mojo Travels, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.